Good morning, friends. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to get together with some family. It was a birthday party for our great nephew, as well as it was an opportunity for us to celebrate the 4th of July together. Well, my, his older brother, uh, Colton, came up to me and he said to me, he said, I remember going to your church. You were up front telling the people. So I'm up here to tell you today, but actually today what I'd like to do is ask for your help, okay? I'd like you to pull out your wallets or your purses, your billfold, dig in your pocket or the bottom of your purse. I'd like you to pull out a bill or a coin, all right? As I was preparing for this sermon this week, I uh, did a, a little bit of research. I pulled out every coin that I could find, different coin, different years. I uh, pulled out the different dollar uh, denominations of bills, uh, you know, ones, fives, tens, and uh, I'd like you to pull those out. If any of you have any fifties or hundreds, if you wouldn't mind bringing them up here, <laughs> I might have to take a good hard long look at it, if you know what I mean. But I want you to notice those bills, all right? Um, if you look at the, the heads of, of the coins, or you look at the back of your bill, you'll notice that there are four words that almost every coin, if not all of them, have in common. In God we trust, right? And so we're going to be talking about that today, that, that slogan, in God we trust. Now, I realize that there's some people in our society that have this idea that, that um, maybe we shouldn't have that on our coinage or on our currency, but I'm not here to talk about that today. I'm not here to bash or to complain about anything or anybody in our country. What I'm here to do today is talk about the fact that we are blessed to be here in the United States of America, aren't we? What a wonderful, wonderful country we live in, that we can walk freely or drive freely to our church and worship without fear of retribution. We can meet in public places and talk about God wherever we are. We can have all kinds of freedoms to travel safely wherever we want to go, pretty much. We don't have to worry about the police breaking into our homes without any good purpose or, or uh, reason. We have all kinds of freedoms in this country. We can follow the American dream. <coughs> Earlier to, uh, this week, I was listening to the radio as I was driving about doing my job. And I was listening to a radio talk show host who was talking about the fact that, uh, about an article that he had read. Now, this article uh, was referring to um, the fact that there were um, uh, some sort of research where uh, they were talking about the fact that there are so many in our, in our country who think it's very difficult anymore uh, to be able to pursue the American dream. In fact, that was a little bit more true of the generation behind mine rather than, than my generation. And what he did is he said, you know, that, don't agree with that. And he pulled out his cell phone and he was talking about his cell phone. He said, you know, this little piece of plastic that we have, we're able to access information almost instantaneously. With this little piece of electronic plastic, we're able to communicate with somebody just about anywhere on the globe, communicate in a lot of different ways, texting, calling on the phone, email. He said there's no place in time when we were able to access information and with the touch of the screen conduct business so freely and so easily as we are able to in our society today. And here in America, these things are everywhere. They're affordable. They're available. In fact, there are people that push them, right? We can pursue the American dream today probably easier than we've ever been able to uh, prior to this time. Folks, we live in a beautiful, wonderful country, and we have so much to be thankful for. And today what I'd like to do is talk about what does it look like to be a, a good citizen, a productive citizen in this country that God gave us. Now the fact is, this is a country that God gave us. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says, There is no authority on earth except that which God has established. So what about this little slogan on our currency and on our coins? In God we trust. 
As I was contemplating that little slogan, I was thinking about the fact that this was a little bit of a play on words, kind of, sort of. Because, you know, in those four words, we have a command as well as a comfort. We have a, a directive as a well as an assurance. We have a guide as well as a consolation. So what does it mean to say, in God we trust, and look at that as a command? Well, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at the Bible passage with me one more time. If you'd like to read the first part with me, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. All right. What this says is that we are directed by Peter to be subject, subject to the president, to the king, to the emperor, whatever form of government we have, to be subject to those that have been put in authority over us, whether that's a, a governor or perhaps uh, the, the chief of police or the mayor or the teacher or the boss or the parents, that we're to be subject to those human forms of government. Now, you know what was kind of interesting as I was doing some study about this Bible passage is the historical context of when Peter wrote this. Things weren't good for Christians during this time. In fact, there was a guy by the name of Nero who was the emperor of the Roman government, and Nero was not a nice guy. And about the time that Peter was writing this stuff down, there was a, a great fire that took place in Rome. In fact, most of Rome, a great, big, a big, great deal of Rome was burned down. And the report was is that Nero sat there playing music as he watched the city go up in flames. And because of his cavalier attitude, the word started getting out that uh, Nero was the one who uh, commanded that the city be set on fire. Maybe for his own amusement, because he really would rather play music and play games rather than govern. But there was also those that, that thought that maybe, you know, he wanted the city to burn down so he could rebuild it and rename it after himself, Neroville or Neroton or something like that. But the fact is, is that Nero heard those words. And to counteract, counteract those accusations, he decided to lay the blame on Christians. And what he did is he told the people that it was the Christians that set this uh, city on fire. And so pretty soon, a bunch of Christians were captured, and they were um, tortured. And as they were being tortured, they um, confessed to things that they, they didn't do. Now, Tacitus, uh, a Roman non-Christian historian, wrote in his book, Annals, that a vast multitude of Christians were convicted, not so much for the charge of burning the city, but as of hating the human race. Isn't it interesting that they were arrested for being haters? We hear that word today in our world today too, don't we? That accusation leveled against Christians. But here is Peter telling the people in that kind of political climate, in that point in history when things weren't good for Christians, that they were to honor that government, that they were supposed to be law-abiding citizens, that they were supposed to honor those, that government as though it was established by God because it was. So how do we live as Christians in this world. Well, Martin Luther and his uh, cohort, Melanchthon, described it this way. He talks about the fact that we live in two kingdoms. Now, very basically, what this means is that you and I, as Christians, first live in the right-hand kingdom. We live in God's kingdom. This is the kingdom that Jesus was talking about when he said, 
My kingdom is not of this world. This is a kingdom that will last forever. This is a kingdom that is spiritual, that is a kingdom that um, goes beyond this earth. This is a kingdom that has been made ours through Jesus Christ. It's given to us by God's grace through faith in Jesus and all that He accomplished for us on the cross and on the, in the empty grave. And so you and I live in this right-hand kingdom. At the same time, we also live in a left-hand kingdom. This is a kingdom that was established for us. This worked earlier today. by God, and we need to remember that the fact is, is that our God, remember He said that no authority on earth exists except that which is established by God. So this is the, the right hand or left hand kingdom, a kingdom of secular origin, whether it be our, our government or maybe even the church, the institutional church whether it be our administrators at the school or our bosses at work or the parents at home, this is our earthly kingdom that we live in. And we are citizens of our country. And we're citizens also of God's kingdom. And that's the dual relationship that you and I live in. So how do we live as citizens of both of these at the same time. Well, I'd like to ask you to read on. Now, this uh, particular government, by the way, this kingdom, is one that is given to us for a purpose. If you look up at the passage that we have up there, it is to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. But how do we live under these kingdoms? Well, first of all, read along with me. This is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. I believe that Peter is giving us a checklist of what it looks like to be a good citizen of both the right-hand kingdom and the left-hand kingdom at the same time. The first item on the checklist is to do good. What he's telling us is that we need to live honest, productive, active lives as citizens in this kingdom. And as we do that in this kingdom, the left-hand kingdom, we are also doing it over here. The second thing that he says we need to do is to love the brotherhood, to honor everyone. In other words, we live together as good neighbors. We've been talking about that here at Peace over the last few years, what it looks like to be a good neighbor. He wants us to be able to be working with people, to be honest businessmen, to be people above reproach and give honor to God in all that we do. The third item on the checklist is that we fear God. We remember that our God is the one who established these governments. It's our God who put those authorities into place. But as we live in fear and love and we live out our lives in honor of God, aren't we also living out lives of love and honor with other people? And the Fourth thing on the list is to honor those in authority, to obey them, to follow them, to show them the respect that is due to them. But folks, here is where the rub comes in. Sometimes what the leaders and authorities do in the left-hand kingdom aren't in accordance with the will of our God under whom we live. And sometimes they don't agree. And our authorities start listening to the rationalizing of mankind, the wisdom of this world, the public opinion, and they start basing their decisions upon that. What do we do then? 
Well, I'd like to propose to you that maybe we should go back to our checklist. That we start by doing good. We still live as law-abiding citizens. We still do the things that our government desires of us. But when laws are passed that are contrary to our God's will, we don't participate. And the reason we don't is because our God is the one who is supreme over this left-hand kingdom. Not everything that is legal is right. Am I correct? Okay. The second thing on the list is that we honor everyone and we love the brotherhood. We still live as good neighbors. We still are honoring of those around us and live honest, productive lives in business and in everything that we do. We still love and care for our neighbors just like we did before. We still want to live lives above reproach so that God can still be honored through everything that we do. But when we have those discussions with our neighbors about those issues, that we do it in honesty, but also with respect and kindness. Peter, in our words, in the very same letter that we're, we're talking about up here, in the next chapter, he says this. He says, in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. Honor Christ the Lord as holy. In other words, we still need to live out the heart of Jesus Christ. And what do we know about the heart of Jesus? Well, we know what he tells us in his word. You want to know the heart of Jesus? Spend time with him. Get to know him. And as we do that, then we are prepared and equipped to be able to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason of hope that is in you. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but we always need to be prepared to make a defense for what is right, what is God's will, and what God desires for His people on this earth and for eternity. And we need to be prepared to do that by spending time in His Word. But as we have those discussions with others, Peter goes on with these words, but do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Friends, as we spend time talking with people about these issues, we need to make sure that we are respectful, that we listen. Fear God. The third item on our checklist when we are faced with these kinds of decisions in our world, I think it's important for us to always keep in mind what God's Word has to say, that we need to listen to His Word, spend time with Him. We need to pray. Pray not only that the Lord would bless our leaders, but that He would bless us. So as votes are going to be cast, that we're prepared to vote in a godly fashion, to have debates and to discuss this with other people, but to do it, again, in gentleness and respect, always remembering that as we share this with people, we're not looking to the rationalization or the wisdom of this world, but that we're going to listen to what God's Word has to say. And then finally, to honor and respect those in authority. Folks, we may not agree with what some of our, the things that our leaders do, we may not uphold some of the decisions that they make, but the fact is, those positions have been established by God. And we need to show respect for the office. We need to pray for those leaders. We need to speak well of them. And we need to support them in any way we possibly can in accordance to God's Word. And finally, We've been talking about this, this slogan, in God we trust, as being a command. But I think it's important that we also look at this slogan from the perspective of being a source of encouragement and consolation to us. We have to remember that even though it looks like our government may be trying to usurp control, even though our government may be stepping, overstepping its bounds in some of the decisions it makes. I want to share with you a psalm, one of my favorites. It's Psalm 46. Many of you are familiar with this, and many of you have brought this to my attention over the years. 
I'd like to read just parts of it with you. It starts with this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, and though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. We don't have to be afraid, even though it appears that our world is falling apart, because our Lord God is our refuge and strength. And then he goes on to say this to us, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Friends, I want to tell you that this kingdom that our Lord has made no, uh, available is ours. Peter tells us that our inheritance is imperishable and undefiled, and it's kept for us by our Father in heaven for safekeeping. It belongs to us. Nothing can overcome this God. He came. He defeated our greatest enemies. Satan, he defeated upon the cross. Death, he defeated by rising from the dead. And then he rose and he sits at the right hand of God. And all authority on heaven and on earth has been placed under his feet. Our God is in control. And he says to you and me, be still. And know that I am God. And know that I am everywhere. Know that I'm in control. Know that I am with you. In God, we trust. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.